Hello, this is Head to Head on UETV and I'm Alice Gerdjuk. Today's topic for discussion is restoration of the liberated territories of the Donbas region. European Union member states are willing to help Ukraine in that. The so-called patronage scheme proposed by Ukraine's President Petro Poroshenko has been agreed on during Ukraine-EU summit. To discuss this, we welcome to the studio Bogdan Ferenc, member of the Secretariat of Parliamentary Assembly, Euronest. Hello and thank you for being with us today, Mr. Ferenc. Hello. So before we start a discussion, let's watch what President had to say or write on his Facebook page about this whole initiative. Ukraine welcomes the readiness of the European Union to engage in the reconstruction and development of the territories of the Donetsk and Luhansk regions that have been liberated from the Russian aggressor. At the EU-Ukraine summit, we agreed to launch my initiative of patronage by interested EU member states over selected cities and areas of these territories to implement targeted assistance projects for infrastructure restoration, economic development, and ensuring the livelihood of communities. So, Petro Poroshenko mentions, quote, interested EU member states. How do you think, what countries in particular is he talking about? What countries could be interested in that? I hope that uh, uh, all countries have to be interested in the e Ukrainian topic, especially uh, on Donbass situation. But uh, as we realize, uh, we have allies in the uh, European Union that are more closer to our agenda and countries that are not so. That's why I think, uh, of course, we should focus in our diplomacy and international relations uh, with uh, countries that are influenced a lot on the agenda inside the EU mm -hmm. member states. France, Germany especially. Mm -hmm. uh, you, in your opinion, who are the strongest allies that Ukraine can rely on in this particular question? Uh, I think uh, that it, it's, it's difficult to, to mention one only country because the EU is a unique uh, uh, union, you know, uh, with some balanced approach. That's why I hope that uh, more member states, approximately m much more than 12, for example, are more closer to Ukrainian agenda. But uh, if you are talking about some uh, countries with uh, which we are neighboring, for example, Poland or uh, uh, Baltic states. Of course, we are very, very close. And uh, these countries, I think, understand much more better Ukrainian people mm -hmm. than, for example, more Western countries. But because of their geopolitical yeah, location. Yeah, of course, the problems that these countries are facing with the Russian Federation. Mm -hmm. But the more, uh, we should realize that we need to maintain in, and to develop the, uh, the cooperation with the most strongest countries inside the EU because they are influenced a lot on the decision-making processes. Mm -hmm. And restoring the Donbass, the first point is political. What is the position from the EU member states? And the second point is financial point concerning what, the assistance. How, how do you think, how could we develop this stronger relations with these countries that you mentioned that are kind of, they have stronger influence on uh, the situation? My personal opinion is that we should refresh our foreign policy, first of all, uh, in the context of more systematic work, for example, in different dimensions. What uh, does it in mean? In intergovernmental dimension, interparliamentary dimension, I can say a few words about this, because I'm involved in the interparliamentary cooperation between the Ukraine, Ukrainian parliament and the European parliament. And of course, uh, uh, we need to uh, shape and un unify our political space between the between Ukraine and the EU member states with, diff with the influence and involvement of different non-governmental organizations too. Because sometimes it's crucial point to have this, this uh, understanding between the countries, between the people. Mm -hmm. So you mean that we should develop the dialogue between the European Parliament and the Ukrainian parliamentarians? Yeah, we have dialogue. What other, I mean, what practical steps can, we, can our diplomats do? What is lacking here in Ukraine? Uh, practical steps, first of all, uh, as I mentioned, uh, understandable systematic strategy towards uh, different member states. Mm -hmm. Because as we know, as we know uh, now we have some problems with some countries, as Hungary, for example, yes. uh, and uh, Poland. 
at the same time and we, we realize this country are member states and if you are willing to be a, a full member sometimes i hope not in uh, 23th century uh, we need to uh, to develop the specific cooperation line with, with this particular countries, of course with the, with the realizing what what uh, what should be the, the main point of our cooperation and, and negotiations. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of our topic of this patronage scheme, uh, it, is, um, it is submitted that cities in the territory formerly occupied by Russia will each be paired with a participating EU member state, which will assist the city as it recovers uh, from the effects of war. How do you think... Um, What's your take on this whole idea and how efficient and effective do you think this whole scheme is or might be if uh, approved? I don't know the, the, the background, back, backstage of this idea. I hope that this idea was discussed before the summit with our counterparts because sometimes, as I know from my practical uh, work, sometimes EU officials or decision makers they just get get no such information from from mass media. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why they are not so happy with some sometimes brilliant ideas of Ukrainian diplomats or officials, but without the previous uh, discussion with them, you know. But I think uh, that for this the practical realization of this patronage uh, uh, proposal, I think it's important to uh, have not only strategic plan for uh, development, for example, infrastructure, re-innovation of, the, of these uh, parts of the Donbass, uh, but uh, a more practical approach in implementing this project and, uh, and uh, getting the assistance that we are receiving from the European Union mm -hmm. without some bureaucratical and long-term long procedures, you know. B because people that are living they are really are living in, in not so good conditions. That's mm -hmm. why with the involvement of EU member states, financial assistance, uh, we can renovate um, infrastructure, for example, roads, safety, uh, schools, and, and, and etc. But at the same time, we should realize that it's our home tax too. And of we course. need to use our budget, for uh, first of all, to, to renovate this territory, but uh, in the context of budget, uh, sometimes it's not so easy to find the money. That's why we should find this money maybe in our oligarchs and other guys that are having tea. Well, actually, there is money. According to Prime Minister Vladimir Groisman, there are 12 billion hryvnias, which equals to over 450 million US dollars, allocated to restore 2,000 objects in uh, liberated territories of Donbass. Plus, Canada and Sweden have allocated $2 million also for the same cause. Um, the thing that wonders me, is this enough money? How do you think? Because the figure is pretty high. Pretty high, but uh, it's only a figure. When we will see a practical real results, when we will visit, for example, these regions, mm -hmm. uh, usually we in the framework of cooperation, interparliamentary cooperation between Ukraine and the EU, I invited I, I, I inviting the uh, members of the parliament from the EU side to visit Donbas, for example. And we are organizing this visit. Why? Because it's important personally for these members to uh, to see the situation, not only to read from the newspapers or from mm -hmm. the reports, but to, to see the real the scale. Of yeah, problems. and to talk with ordinary people that are living every day with this dramatically difficult, mm -hmm. under these dramatically and uh, very difficult obstacles, you know. But on the other hand, the, uh, the restoration um, shouldn't be only about infrastructure. It should also involve this kind of social support and of also course. some kind of assistance for the entrepreneurs and other people who remain actually uh, on this uh, territories that were liberated. So um, what is being done by the Ukrainian government towards that? Uh, I think a lot depends uh, on the Ukrainian government, but all on the local authorities too, mm -hmm. and the uh, level of understanding between uh, different uh, uh, subjects of, of this uh, process, you know. The local authorities, you mean, of those territories uh, yes, that of course. got liberated? Of course. As I know, some, sometimes uh, the local authorities 
are changing, mm -hmm. uh, by, are changed by, by different uh, mm -hmm. obstacles and c circumstances. But uh, I think we should, and the government has to do more and much harder uh, in more practical sense. Uh, for example, I know that there are a lot of projects uh, that uh, f by the financial assistance of EU side are trying to be implemented in these territories for use, for example, for the NGO representatives. But what is about Ukraine as a state and uh, some state projects towards uh, involvement young people, for example, in political processes on local levels? Mm -hmm. Because it's very important to have this, uh, to work with young people, uh, young generation, because these people are able to change on the local level the situation. Mm -hmm. Uh, to try to be more involved in political processes, maybe to be elected to the city councils. And with the new quality of political and civil life, we can hope for the better for these regions. Yeah, not our, not ideas. just waiting for some assistance, mm -hmm. supports, uh, member states, the US uh, affiliation and uh, in this uh, regard, but doing our home task to help these people uh, to live in better better conditions. Well, speaking of the local authorities, if you touch this topic, uh, self-governance in this uh, uh, territories of Donbass, uh, liberated territories of Donbass, uh, is being done by, uh, well, special status uh, uh, governments. Mm -hmm. What I think that for just for our audience it will be useful to understand what does this mean, this special s status of governance in those territories? Uh, due to this special status, for example, uh, they have the, the right, for example, to realize some uh, initiatives or to uh, uh, maintain or conduct some procedure without uh, long bureaucratic uh, procedure, for example, with the government. You know. mm -hmm. uh, as I know, they are having much more money than other regions in the context of development, because the, fo the focus, political focus now on... Uh, is on this regions? Yeah, on these regions. But uh, from my personal uh, opinion and experience, with my personal opinion, uh, it, it's always uh, the, the picture that some people in the city councils, in political parties, are willing in real way to change the situation and doing quite good job, but uh, more people uh, mm. just sitting uh, and doing uh, all these uh, pr procedure things, bureaucratic procedures. things, not in proper way. Mm -hmm. And this influences a lot on the dynamic of this uh, re-innovation uh, of this so region. So it's not effective, you say? Of course. Mm -hmm. It depends on the, on the personal level too, sometimes, you know, it depends on the governance, it depends on the local political parties and the willing of the uh, ordinary people to, to do our home tasks, uh, to, to, uh, to, to reintegrate and to, to develop. Uh, why I'm, I'm talking about the infrastructure? Because I think with the good quality of the roads and with the good, for example, um, quality of public uh, sectors or schools, it's more visible for other people on other side to see that uh, it's not only the political talking that here something, some, some things, some reforms are being implemented, mm -hmm. but people to people contact is important. And when uh, people f from other, uh, on other side will see the real changes in development, mm -hmm. I think it will be our victory. So you think that they need to see this reflection from the from the reforms on paper of into course, the real uh, I mean the real we life. We can talk. Our officials can talk a lot, mm -hmm. but uh, when you are just traveling and you know five hours uh, by car, for example, with all this uh, mess. Um, it's not reforming process. And the very last question to ask, as we're running out of time, how does this special status of the occupied territories that we just talked about contribute to the introduction of the UN uh, peacekeeping uh, mission in the occupied territories? Uh, I think that uh, this special status is only a part uh, that can help in, of course. in, in uh, implementing this peacekeeping mission initiative, but it depends not only on our uh, side, unfortunately. It depends a lot on the uh, geopolitical players as the uh, USA, Russia Federation and, and European, uh, Union. European Union. When the negotiations in these regards will 
continue in more practical uh, way, I think we can expect some slightly changes in, in this regard. But now I'm not so sure on the context of the eve of elections that we will have in Ukraine. And uh, usually when inside the country uh, all political parties are, are preparing for the big battle, they are not so interested to, <coughs> uh, to, to press uh, the very tangible topics, uh, you know, and to discuss this with the partners. That's why we should hope, but in reality I think it's, it will be not so easy to implement and to reach. Well, let's see how the situation is going to develop. So far, I thank you for this conversation. It was really interesting. Thank you very much for the invitation. This was Bogdan Ferenc, member of the Secretariat of Parliamentary Assembly Euronest. Thank you for watching Head to Head. I'm Alas Gorduk. Goodbye.